videos of, um, of all the panelists, Binda. Um, And let me let me start by introducing the panelists. So we we have a great panel, um, um, several of whom you've you've seen many times on this uh, before. So they need little introduction. Um, Scott Aronson, um, I think you you all know. Um, uh, he's of course you know the most relevant thing to this lecture is that he's. Um, He's, he, of course, uh, introduced the notion of shadow tomography, and which sort of got some of this work going. He recently received the ACM Prize in Computing, but you know, there's much more to say, but I'll move on. Uh, there's Dorit Arno, who again needs no introduction here. She, she introduced many, um, many of the important uh, you know, results right from the beginning of the field, uh, fault tolerance and uh, universality of adiabatic computation. But again, for this particular uh, colloquium, the most relevant things are that she's, you know, she was one of the first people thinking about um, uh, how to verify quantum computations, as well as, you know, introducing these, these ideas about interactive experiments, uh, quantum experiments. Um, um, Dorit, of course, is now also uh, founded a company called Quedma, which, which deals with, uh, with um, benchmarking, um, uh, quantum benchmarking, and maybe even interactive experiments, we don't know. Uh, uh, we also have Ignacio Sirac, who, um, who of course um, is, a, uh, is a condensed matter theorist, um, who's, who, um, who has introduced most of the, many of the early ideas about how to actually translate um, um, you know, theoretical ideas into actual, uh, you know, practical um, uh, experimental setups, you know, so how to create quantum computers in practice. Um, he's the winner of the Wolf Prize and the Max Planck uh, Medal, among, among other things. And then um, it's great to also have uh, Ilad Hazan, who's um, uh, from Princeton. Um, He's he's um, he's um, he's also the co-founder and the director of the uh, of Google AI at Princeton. Uh, Ilad is um, is the is the co-inventor of the AdaGrad algorithm for deep learning, and um, he's also worked extensively on convex programming. And for those of you who've um, uh, you know you you probably you know, if you've seen IP equal to P space, you, you probably know about the very famous uh, Aurora Hazan Kali uh, result. So, um, so maybe we can, can we start with, uh, with uh, you know, your reactions to the talk and your comments about it in, in any order, maybe uh, who'd like to go first? Uh, uh, Scott, do you want to start since you, well, yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, you know, I mean, I've been amazed by what people have done over the last couple of years with, you know, this framework of classical shadows and uh, applying it to various physics problems. You know, I feel like I've, you know, contributed almost nothing to the subject of shadow tomography at this point, you know, other than, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, I, 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 I did write the first paper about it, but I didn't even give it its name. Uh, Steve Flamia, uh, who I see is here, is the one who uh, suggested this, uh, this cool name of shadows. Um, uh, but you know, so, so, so there were, there were two kind of uh, very different uh, uh, directions that were that were discussed today. Uh, the first one was was sort of not uh, complexity at all. It was sort of about a question that is. Uh, orthogonal to you know what we usually worry about in, uh, um, in 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 quantum computing. It was about sort of just what what aspects of a system are are learnable at all, right? Uh, or you know which aspects of the world are 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 uh, sort of intrinsically hidden from us, right? And now this is this is not at all a new question. I mean, I was just saying in the chat window, right? This is a question that in some sense goes back hundreds of years in physics. 
right? And, you know, a lot of the progress in physics was precisely to realize sort of which aspects of our equations actually correspond to something that's observable and which ones are, 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 are not observable or are just, you know, uh, um, um, aspects of the, the coordinates that we chose or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so uh, you know, um, 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 physicists don't, you know, stay up at night worrying that, you know, because of gauge transformations that, you know, that there's some problem with the scientific enterprise, you know, they just say that, well, the things that we can't measure are, 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 are if, if, if they really cannot be measured uh, uh, in principle, then they are unphysical, you know, and uh, if they can't be measured, but just by this set of, of, uh, of allowed operations, uh, but a different set, you know, uh, would allow us to measure them, well, then that's just a limitation of that set of operations. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, we could give another example, right? They suppose that last night, every, you know, someone came and replaced every complex number by its conjugate, right? How would we know? Well, you know, we wouldn't know, right? You know, that's okay. But, uh, um, you know, you can, you know, and you, you could construct an example based on that of two uh, world models that were, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in the sense of this work that were indistinguishable for, uh, uh, from one another, even though they're, they're, they're formally different. Okay, now uh, the, the second part of the talk uh, was about these uh, uh, separations, uh, 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 like uh, uh, learning tasks that a, a quantum learner could do with only, you know, O of one accesses or samples or whatever, even though a classical learner would provably uh, need an exponential number of samples, you know, building on earlier work and, uh, uh, you know, including, including some very recent work in the same direction. And um, so, so I, 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 I like these kind of results. I did want uh, um, to, to get clarification about something, which is, you know, when, when you talk about quantum versus classical learners, Right. It sounds a lot like what, you know, back in the, in the olden days, uh, uh, you know, we used to call just uh, like, you know, uh, um, coherent measurements or, you know, entangling measurements versus unentangled measurements, mm -hmm. right? Like in the study of the hidden subgroup problem, right? People became very familiar with the fact that, well, okay, if I have to measure each coset state separately, I might need many, many more samples than if I can do, you know, an entangled measurement on all of them together, right? So it sounds like, you know, it, it, uh, it, it sounds just kind of, kind of like a new terminology for that, you know, in which case it's, you know, it, 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 it's very good to know, you know, not, 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 not surprising, I would say, that these separations uh, uh, should exist, but maybe I'm missing something. Ah, I see. So I guess, in, so in, in this previous settings you're saying <clears throat> about, having these copies and people can do like POVM measurements on each copy and potentially adaptively changing, yet it's still impossible to consider it. I see, I see. Yeah, in terms of that, um, I think for learning about states, that does sound like a very similar setting um, as here. But uh, um, I guess here the purpose is to understand what are some slightly more practical situation that people would actually care about. Um, I'm not ent entirely sure about um, the practicality about these coset problems, but I do think that these like predicting properties and so on could potentially be more useful in real world such situations. So I guess that's also one of the main aim is to um, understand if it's possible. And we use the different words. I mean, actually, in, in our paper, there have been a lot of words for it. Like I think in Dorit's paper, it's called incoherent qualm versus coherent qualm. In some of our more recent work, we're calling them algorithm without classical memory versus algorithm with classical memory, uh, with quantum memory uh, and without quantum memory. So there's quite a few of words, um, but I guess that are, those are just words, but deep in the heart, it's really about a similar thing. But I also do feel like um, there's this other aspect, which is like, uh, when, when it's a quantum process rather than just states. I think in states, it's much clearer and people ha can have studied it like in this hidden coset set states um, before these quantum processes. Um, I think there's, it has not been formally um, like properly defined how to separate between them. So, and in Dorit's older work, I think she considered it 
um, also slightly different from how we consider it later, which is a more generalized version um, in certain situations. Okay, it's probably the rich, you, you have things to say. I just want to remark, I think Scott, maybe maybe I'm not aware of that, but um, I think that uh, that uh, previous works didn't consider adaptive situations. And this makes the proofs uh, much, much more complicated, like uh, ruling out um, independent samples, um, incoherent independent samples uh, is much easier than than ruling out what you can do adaptively. Yes. Oh, much, oh, much. Oh, 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 I agree with that. No, if you're talking about the hidden subgroup problem, you know, I completely believe that the works, you know, did not handle the adaptive case. I mean, I know that in my paper on shadow tomography and in, you know, my and Guy Rothblum's uh, later paper on, uh, you know, general measurement and differential privacy, we, we explicitly raised this question, right? We asked right. whether, you know, adaptive measurements, you know, uh, 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 will, will help, whether they'll, you know, they'll let you do as well as you could have done with uh, an entangling measurement, or I guess with a, a quantum memory or, or a qualm, you're calling it. So I don't know, but, you know, I, I might have some qualms about that, about that, <laughs> about that acronym. But, uh, but, but uh, you know, but, 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 but we, 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 we asked this question, and, and I'm very happy that, that, that this question now, now seems to have an answer, that, that yes, with, you know, coherent measurements, you can do better than you can do with adaptive measurements. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dory, for clarification. I, 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 for some reason, I thought Scott meant that even for adaptive scenario, people have already solved it. But okay, uh, that's good to know. Did you want to? We were aware of it as a thing that one should do. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Scott, did you have more? Whose turn is now? Uh, so, Dory, please, please. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, so Robert, thanks a lot for the really beautiful talk. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to say a few things. First of all, about, for me, this is a fascinating subject. Um, Umesh mentioned earlier uh, interactive experiments. I think all, intera all experiments are interactive. Um, the thing that's really exciting in, in, in your work and in previous works, um, also what we were interested in, in our work with uh, with Jordan Kotler and Shailing Shi, is is uh, is making this structured, making really that this is sort of for me a start of of a theory of how physicists interact with nature in a structured way, much like um, interactive proofs do, um, and the whole the whole process of you know any experiment even you can't really isolate one experiment from the next experiment. So a single experiment could be non-interactive, but in fact, the whole process of a physicist with nature is an interactive process and making this structured in, and, and uh, you know, uh, providing a framework to study this, I think this is really an important step in, 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 you know, in understanding the scientific method. Um, so, so to me, this is really, really interesting. Um, uh, and I wanted to to also say that uh, you mentioned uh, the experiment uh, on sycamore, um, and I think I think this is still there is still this open question of the noise of of handling noise in the system, right? I mean, this this is not uh, we still don't know if uh, if these quantum advantages can be uh, seen even in the presence of noise, uh, the exponential advantages. Is that true? That, I mean, this is this is also true. Right. So actually, and in, in the first part, I talked about like learning these noisy systems and so on. So in that in that paper, actually, it, it hasn't been put out yet. It probably still take a long time, a, a while, since we're printing out. But basically, we have a proof showing that, um, like the task we consider, like this learning physical states task, when the, like this quant, like this quantum agent procedure when there's noise in this quantum agent, um, you can show that the advantage would still be there, but now it would be a polynomial advantage rather than an exponential advantage. And the exponent of the polynomial will actually increases as the noise decreases and it can increase indefinitely. So basically approaching exponential more and more. So as the noise becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, um, mm -hmm. the polynomial advantage becomes bigger. So like, for example, here are some concrete numbers. If there's like 1% of error 
in a two qubit operation, then one could show that the advantage would actually be something like NC will be, which is the number of experiments required by classical agent will be equal to NQ, which is the number of experiments required by quantum agent to the power of 18, which is a huge polynomial advantage in that kind of regard. So, so yeah, so in the noise set, noisy setting, how to achieve exponential advantage is still not clear to me, but at least we can have this like very large polynomial advantage. And that's actually what's happening in the Sycamore experiment. Um, we're seeing here, okay, so let me, maybe I, if it's possible, I could show it again. But in this part of the graph, we're, we, we're seeing this separation between this exponential and this seems to be much flatter. So note that this is a log scale. This seems to be much flatter, um, but I think this is still something that's kind of uh, um, exponential in system size, but just with a much, much flatter kind of uh, um, scaling. So, so, so the resulting would be like a polynomial advantage rather than an exponential advantage, but it's still a very large advantage as one could sort of extrapolate here and so on. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I want to say that uh, I think conceptually the answer to this question is known. We do know that uh, in fault tolerant, I mean, if, if somehow the physical system that you're trying to study is fault tolerance, then then it is known that there would be an exponential advantage, but but just coming up with a, a real scenario uh, would be very interesting. I right. think I think also there is this interesting difference. I mean, there's sort of two aspects. Learn when you, you talk about learning from the point of view of learning theory, um, this, this focuses on the number, number of experiments and number of samples. And yes. there's also the, uh, a different aspect, which is the actual complexity of the experiment. And it's very easy to confuse between them. Um, they're, they're different. And, uh, and I think uh, both, both questions are very, very interesting. Um, Right, so for my okay. talk, most of the time I focus on this uh, sample complexity and number of experiments. Um, but at least for the experiment, like the actual physical experiments we do, they have to be like computationally efficient and then they are computationally efficient. But yeah, but some of, yeah, but most of the time I focus on that and there could be some difference. For example, when the number of experiments doesn't have an exponential separation, it's still possible that the computation time has an exponential separation or something like that. So that's a... Great comment. Thanks, Terry. Um, Ignacio or Elad? Uh, okay, well, uh, so let me start just thanking Aroe for this uh, great talk. It's really very clear, I think. Um, and uh, well, I have several comments. So first, I wanted to say that I'm the only physicist here, but I think that uh, Dorit is also a physicist, or, or at least studied physics at some point. <laughs> and, uh, I, so, I think that. <laughs> and in the panel. But anyway, anyway, so my, I mean, I'm coming to this from a different direction, so probably my, ask, my, my questions and my comments are going a different direction. Uh, so a, a very general comment. So I think that uh, physicists like me are getting very excited about all these results coming from computer scientists. Uh, about physics <laughs> and so really I mean for some years we had uh, many uh, results in computer science about computer science about um, algorithms quantum algorithms ways of solving some problems uh, faster but now we see that they I mean, we can learn a lot from from them from the methods and I mean Dori just mentioned these interactive uh, proofs and the way that we interact with experiments and also very similar from what you presented here and all the works that uh, you and John and all the people have done in the past so try to, to know that. Now, uh, in particular, um, I would say that uh, from the point of view of many body physics, that's the part that I'm interested in. Uh, I mean, I see uh, I'm very clear is a, uh, things to learn from uh, these uh, shadow methods in general. And in particular, I think that they would be very powerful in, com in combination with uh, some other classical methods for simulation in which you just get the results from classical computer, then you can predict things beyond what you can do I mean, with these other methods and also with quantum simulations. Right now there is, in the physics community, there is a lot of interest now using this uh, analog or quantum computers to solve problems 
that we cannot solve in classical computers and all the methods that you're talking about, I think that they would be very useful and they are already useful in that context. So they will go, so typically, uh, I mean, we are used in, in, in our field to, uh, I mean, have some, I mean, there is Schor's algorithm, there is Gore's algorithm, and then somebody takes an experiment with three ions, this, this, this experiment and publishes a super science paper, then with four qubits and another <laughs> nature paper, wonderful. These are demonstrations that do the force, but don't really don't have any implication for our uh, knowledge, because we don't learn so much about that. But I think that now we are approaching the the, 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 the situation in which we can learn <laughs> now really things with from experiments, if you just take the methods that you mentioned. Now, uh, from the talk, maybe some, some comments and, and some, some questions. And uh, so the comment is that, so that two parts of the talk. So first about learnable uh, uh, or learnability about systems. So um, I'm not so sure how to find direct applications is to at least the things that I have in mind, but I guess learning what is unlearnable would tell us. So how to improve our experiments to make them learnable. So I guess that that's one of the messages that I'm really taking from here. So that what Scott says that if it's not learnable, then what should we care about? But maybe we can do make it learnable just by pushing a little bit our hardware, <laughs> our methods. Now, regarding the, the second part of your uh, talk, let me tell you some, something that I would be very intrigued. And uh, I'm very interested in the context of analog quantum simulators so that people have now either atoms or ions superconducting, and then they can uh, just engineer interaction between the qubits in such a way that they represent some model that you would like to solve and you cannot solve with a classical computer. This happens in condensed matter physics, in chemistry, in, in high energy physics. And so I'm, I'm wondering how this applies now to a real problem. So in the sense that at the end, I mean, I want to solve, let's say, uh, lattice QCD for QCD for young Mill theory and something. I give you Hamiltonian and I tell you, what, I'm, and that's something that I cannot answer with a classical computer. Now, I give it to you, I let it interact with that quantum. So, I mean, you can not only prepare a state, but you can also now measure and depending on the measure, do something. And so, how, what, what can I learn? And so, what I will be able to solve with that? And of course, uh, taking into account that these systems and these models are not perfect. So there was also raised in some previous uh, questions. So I'd like to put everything together, like many of the questions that we are asking today to see some practical problem that I think that is urgent to solve in physics and how now with the experiments, plus the methods that you're presenting or Dorit or, or Scott and so on, then it can help to solve these methods. Or you see it at the moment more like a, I mean, like some kind of fundamental study in which uh, I mean you're just uh, I mean trying to learn about more, but I mean the experiments are not at that position and cannot. I mean, there's not yet so much to to let's say to 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 learn in physics from what you're saying. So my question is then that so can you envision now some particular scenario? Let me hundred qubits in a lattice in which I can. I have an error per gate or something or error in my Hamiltonian. And then I would be able to do things that I cannot do with a classical computer. Yeah, I think that's a that's a that's a, that's the question. Right? I think that's the question that everyone in our field we're trying to answer. Um, for the talk, I, I think it's more, as you said, um, at the moment, it's more like some fundamental results that could potentially build us towards answering that question. So like we discussed all about these advantages, but how could this advantage be useful? When will we want to predict these kind of properties? And understanding this connection, I think is a very important future work um, and to realize it in, in nature. Like, yeah, like we, we know that there are situations where one could use this classical shadow method. But of course, using classical shadow method, you can still combine it with quantum simulators, like analog quantum simulators, and, and do things with that. So, um, but yeah, I let guess. Me, let me maybe, maybe a bit more specific. So imagine that I have a, a, an experiment, and I would like to solve uh, uh, some, or let's make some predictions about, let's say, the dynamics or the ground state or something of a Hamiltonian that I cannot build with my system. So, I mean, I, I have, for example, atoms, and the atoms have two body interactions. So, the Hamiltonian has like a two local, a two local, but the Hamiltonian that I want to solve is four local. 
And of course, we can use perturbation gadgets and so on like that. But, but I mean, this perturbation gadget will make the noise much bigger because it has to work in perturbation here. So is there uh, something that, I mean, there is, is there a, a procedure in such a way that, uh, I mean, your method could help, or these methods in general could help me to not to have to build in, in these gadgets, but rather with right. what I have to, to, to learn and then to use them to make predictions that have some, uh, yeah, so I guess that that would be closer to sort of my review on what John Preskill talked about, where we consider like these classical machine learning combining classical shadow for predicting ground states or um, these kind of quantum many body problems. So, so yeah, I think that's indeed what we envision um, the going forward on, on that part of the line. Actually, I've actually covered quite a few different lines that could be branched out. I think this is particularly closer to to that in the sense that I guess in, in this case, you're probably not going to have a quantum computer since you're just trying to build a quantum system. So you're probably not going to have a quantum computer, but only have a classical computer, but you can do some kind of quantum measurements on your system in order to understand it. Then, then yeah, I think it's, uh, it's closer to that line. We do have some results on, on that front in the sense that um, we can have we can learn from certain physical system that we go to build, and then we can predict properties about systems that's never been created in the physical lab. So some of your examples that you said, I think potentially fits into it. Um, however, we do know that in our proof, at least at the moment, what we consider is more of like a statistical generation in the sense that we can sample randomly in the space and then generalize, but not in the sense that we only sample partially, like in a small part of the space, and then we wanted to generalize to something that's very different. Um, I think currently, I'm not entirely sure, maybe Ilad would have some comments on it about whether it's possible to have this kind of more stronger form of generation. Like you only learn from the subset and then you wanted to predict for a bigger subset, what kind of guarantee could we have and so on. I think that's still a little bit unclear at the moment, even in just the machine learning field in general. Um, but yeah, but I think that line of work could potentially one day be useful for answering this question. I, I want to just say that I think that the, Ignacio, your question is, is basically a question about a quantum algorithm, right? I mean, we're actually looking, you have a problem um, in mind, and we're looking for a quantum algorithm, which involves, um, you know, physical systems that we're sampling or that we're probing. And you know the design of quantum algorithms is a very very complicated task. We don't have a general method. I mean, this is basically the beginning of uh, a theory of of quantum algorithms for you know quantum protocols for learning physical systems or measurements. Uh, but we don't have a general recipe for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but, is, but there, is, sorry. So maybe maybe if I, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I agree with that. But I was putting on top of that the fact that we don't have. Uh, you have some restrictions also from the physics uh, side. And so that we are not able just to build any two qubit gates, anything that you want perfectly. And so there are things that we can do well, where things that cannot be done well. And whether it at already at this level, there's something that you can help that, uh, to, to, yeah, that goes in that direction. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, uh, so the Sycamore's example mm -hmm. is, is such an example. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, the experiment that Robert was talking about is, is an example in a very restricted setting. But yeah, that, that would, that's a, I would basically like to understand the details of your question, to understand the, the algorithmic question more precisely. Okay. Um, okay, well, thanks, um, Ignacio. So Ilad has been waiting very patiently. So it would be great to hear a perspective from the viewpoint of classical machine learning or, you know, from, from, from your viewpoint of it. Uh... Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. Really a pleasure to be here. And um, I hope I can say something interesting. The little I know about quantum, uh, I learned from Dorit, who was teaching me in undergrad. And uh, then I also happened to be a friend of Scott, so I collaborated with him a little bit. But I don't, it's not like I'm an expert on the subject. I hope I can say something from the lens of uh, machine learning and uh, like similar to what Ignacio said I'm excited by the relationship between the two fields so quantum tomography was or shadow tomography uh, was a very nice connection between learning and 
um, and quantum theory. And it gave back to learning also because there are all these special uh, regularizations that you can look at and in, in the complex plane and so on that to help classical learning as well, but of course also gives back to learning theory. Um, so in, in that light, I want to say um, a little bit about the relationship that I kind of reminded me in the two parts of your talk. So the first part talked about uh, tomography or, or learning, um, and this pertains to some kind of um, supervised learning, or I would say active learning, because you're kind of trying to actively design the queries to the, to the state and, learn, and infer the state from that. Um, and this reminded me, so I'm just talking about, it reminds me of a field called um, experiment design. I mean, I myself have studied this before, but only from the perspective of what uh, Scott taught me, which is basically unconstrained um, activations. I imagine this might relate to what Ignacio is saying. In the physical world, there are various constraints. You cannot query whatever you want uh, of, the, of the quantum state. And this uh, amounts to physical constraints that you can, in, at least in the classical world, pose as a geometric constraint on the set that you're querying from. Um, this has been very well studied in statistics. It's called optimal design of experiments. And there is a very interesting set of math that because you can see that there is a relationship to geometry, right? There's a strong relationship to convex geometry. What kind of points can you query? In? And let's say you have a budget. You're only allowed to pick 10 points. What's the optimal 10 points you can query in the space that will give you the maximum amount of information? Um, and there are various interesting solutions, very interesting, but from a mathematical point of view in the classical world, and I would be very interested to see what happens in the quantum world. Uh, you asked uh, Robert uh, how it pertains to generalization. I guess maybe this was more in the second part of your, of your talk. So maybe I'll talk about part, part two. So part two, uh, was a bit more ambitious. And here you have uh, not only queries, but they also affect the system and kind of propagates, right? You have uh, in quantum world, I never understood that perfectly, but you, when you query, you also affect the state and, and so on. So there is an effect of, of the action on the system. Um, in machine learning, uh, I should say, in quantum, the learning of literature that I'm familiar with is restricted to supervised learning and active learning. But um, we don't, as humans, we don't only learn from observation or from experiment. We learn from um, action, taking action and then observing. This is called reinforcement learning or control. Control is very similar, by the way, to what you presented. I, I'll remark in a minute. We learn from imitation, uh, apprenticeship, teaching, teachers. We learn, in my opinion, the unsolved mystery so far is deduction. So. Yeah, right, so uh, theory of relativity is not from observation. It's from only from deduction of uh, what we know from other observations or actions in the past. So there are many, many mechanisms for learning. And I feel that, or at least I haven't seen much literature in the quantum world about it. It's very interesting to see what the quantum agent can do with these other types of learning mechanisms. Most related to what you discussed is that of um, learning in dynamical systems, because you have the effect of uh, influencing the system that you touch upon. Um, I don't know how much this audience is familiar with the linear dynamical system. That's the simplest possible version of reinforcement learning, where you take an action and that action affects the system and you get to see an observation and, and so forth. So you not only measure, but you directly affect the state of the world by in the simplest possible way. This is linear, but could be, of course, different form of dynamics. Um, and I would be very interested to see, there is some very deep mathematics developed in the control theory world. It goes back decades and you know, centuries, very deep math about uh, how to study and, and identify. It's actually very related to system identification. Um, and I think there is a lot of room for a lot of potential from the techniques that you discussed and how they can be extended to that world of uh, linear, learning a linear dynamical system and system identification. Great, um, thanks a lot. Um, um, any any response, Robert, to all the comments? I guess you've already been saying stuff, but uh... yeah. So so in particular for the last comment, I think these are 
these are yeah these are very nice comments and um like for example i i actually never haven't dived deeply into these classical theory on experimental design it does felt like what ignacio have talked about and this field and potentially some of the results that i've worked on might be combined in some organic or interesting way that could potentially lead to some interesting results um so yeah i would also look for um and i'll probably spend some time looking deeper into these kind of literature. Thank you so much. Sorry, just, um, I, I wanted to come back to something. So Dorit, I didn't quite understand your idea, your comments about why what Ignacio was saying was, was related to algorithm design or that it boiled down to algorithm design. So could you, or did I misunderstand? Uh, um, no, I mean, so, so basically, can you hear me? I'm not muted, yeah. right? Um, uh, what I meant is that uh, essentially, if, if you don't only care about uh, query complexity, but you care about the complexity of, of, the, of the experiment, yeah. Um, yeah. meaning uh, the gate complexity plus query complexity, um, then, what, then what happens is that uh, you have to somehow uh, create a protocol of interaction with the physical system um, that in a sense is a quantum algorithm which makes queries but also has has to anal has to somehow massage the information and and it's, okay. it's basically a quantum algorithm uh, with which is more complicated than a general quantum algorithm and and I think that uh, quantum algorithmic ideas should enter the picture here and I, as far as I understand we have really just touched the the tip of the iceberg from that point of view um, and you know uh, designing experiments with with quantum advantage when you use coherent uh, the quantum tricks that have been used are very very rudimentary um, and 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 also I think they're very very limited so far to specific cases and and uh, and for each for each particular problem like Ignacio's problem is is a specific in problem, one one will probably have to design a new quantum algorithm. Mm -hmm. I meaning a new quantum algorithmic measurement, as we call it, or a new quantum protocol for a measurement. Right. So if I may say something, uh, so uh, so sometimes uh, I guess that the question that we physicists ask can be uh, written in terms of uh, hypothesis testing. So you have an hypothesis and you want to know whether it's yes or not. So you have some phase of matter, you want to be superconducting, nor superconducting. And so now you have a machine there and it is not perfect that you know something, but you don't know anything like uh, Robert was explaining. So, I mean, the measurements are not exactly like they are. And then you would like to see optimization. So how you can say yes, no, with the maximum probability of guessing, right? And then, because then you have to tickle, and then that at the end is a kind of optimization problem. And then I guess that this optimization problem you formulate it properly, then you will have a set of instructions, quantum, classical, and everything that you will have to give in order to do that. And if you see it as general as that, I guess that you can formulate it in that in that form. However, it's a very difficult problem. And in general, I don't know how where to start, basically. So the question is whether we can make a systematic ways in which to approach those solutions in order to get. Uh, answers because this is happening and will happen more and more in the future that we have these equipments and we want to answer some questions but we don't know if you are answering the question or not or if it's optimal it's, and and things like that so i see that from that point of view it's very useful what you're i mean what you're what you're discussing here and the, the, all your work that you did in the past for all three of you yeah um Sorry, Robert, just going, going back to this notion of um, these entangled measurements, right, that one has yeah. to do in order to... So is, do you have a sense of, well, um, you know, would, would making entangled measurements that give you something useful in practice, you know, do, do, you, do you expect that to impose a, a major cost in terms of, you know, how hard it is to do those, you know, create those highly entangled uh, measurements or, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the resources required or the resources in terms of fidelity, et cetera, right? Right, right. Yeah, so um, 
I briefly mentioned a few things. Like for example, in the experiments that we implement on Sycamore processor, that's actually only a constant depth quantum circuit. So you have two copy and then you just apply a constant depth quantum circuit on top of it, and then you can do it. So for that, the fidelity requirements and like I said, it's very low. And mm -hmm. even if you have like 5% error for each two cubic gate, you can already get a huge polynomial advantage that could be um, already be seen. And that's what we are seeing in our experiments because like, for example, in Sycamore processor, their measurement fidelity is not very high. Whenever you do a measurement on one qubit, there might be a roughly like three to 5% of error that could happen. Um, but even in terms of that, we can still already see these kind of advantage. So for the situation that we consider, like for example, predicting absolute value of like Pauli observables and things like that, it's possible to realize it. But then the question is, are they useful for anything? Um, so I think it will be most useful when the situation is more like you wanted to predict um, a more general set of observables and so on. Um, however, for those kind of problems, like if you just have an arbitrary general observable, I think in one of Scott's previous work, it's already been shown that it's highly unlikely that one could actually predict all of them very efficiently on quantum computer. There are some limitations to that with connection to complexity theory. Um, however, it, it's, it does seem possible that um, um, I would imagine situations where you have certain uh, more complicated many body system, um, maybe some material or certain certain molecule and things like that. And you wanted to be able to learn some property about such kind of systems, then potentially maybe you can use, you can shine light on it and capture the photons, maybe one day store it in quantum memory and then store multiple copies and stuff up and do some entangled measurement on top. Um, I think this transaction part um, where you have quantum sensor, um, like shining lights and capturing this light coherently and storing it in quantum memory. I think that's still quite challenging. Um, I know that people have been actively studying this uh, in, in, about this in the field called transduction, but, but still, I think the transduction fidelity at the moment is still pretty low. Um, I think it's also a problem even in other kind of field, like in quantum network. Um, in order to build quantum internets, people have also need this important ingredient of transduction where one could transduce from like microwave signals to like like more other kinds of light signals. Um, even for that, I think that maybe Ignacio Sirac can correct me or provide some context, but I heard it was the fidelity was like 10 to the negative four or five, which is extremely low. And improving on that would be very important for sort of um, building on top of these um, line of works. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robert. So we are getting close to uh, time here. So um, just um, just want to see if anybody has anything else to say on the panel or you or um, maybe even the audience before we call, call this to an end. I have a quick question um, for Ilad. Um, so, so you mentioned sort of this connection with the field of control where you sort of, if I understand correctly, you have an unknown dynamical system. You not only want to learn the dynamics, so basically doing system identification, which is what Robert was doing, but you also want to sort of simultaneously control the state to be, let's say, in a certain region. And you mentioned sort of you're interested in the connection of this to quantum computing, right? For this connection, I was wondering, do you have in mind more using quantum computing to learn a classical, learn and control a classical dynamical system? Or do you have in mind some ideas for controlling uh, a quantum system? Do you have thought, thoughts of using quantum computing to control um, a quantum system? Well, thanks for the question, Andrea. I, I mean, this was, I, rem I think my comments for the second part of the talk, which were more vague, um, it just reminded me I guess um, the field of trying to learn um, a system from observation, uh, which is not only 
doesn't only have the objective of learning, but also to reach a desired state. Um, that is the field of learning in dynamical systems. So that is tackled by that mathematical technique. The reason I think that this particular, what I, was referring, what I think can be particularly interesting here is the, um, the fact that the mathematics that you folks are using, um, namely norm, norms of where the complex matrices and so on, I think these are very interesting for, because if you know the literature, a system is, if, for example, stable, a linear dynamical system is stable, if it's something called the spectral radius is less than one. This is an interesting uh, object. It's not the eigenvalue of the matrix. It's not the, the singular value. It's something to do with, you take the, mat the matrix of this, describing the system, if it's a linear system, and take all its powers, and you look at the kind of the infinite uh, horizon, and this is bounded as a series. It's an interesting object. Um, I have a feeling that uh, this kind of interesting mathematics uh, can be even more, you know, compounded by using the stuff that you guys are doing, the, the complex analysis techniques. It's more of a hunch. I mean, I don't have, <laughs> I have not worked on that stuff at all, but I've seen this happen, for example, in, in the shadow tomography, that stuff. Uh, Scott showed, showed me some very interesting things that happened there that I didn't expect. So, for example, Scott's early result, right? You can learn, uh, even though there are exponentially many states, you can need only poly number of measurements. That's kind of the really early results. You can need only poly number of measurements to learn the whole thing. And various issues that arise there that I didn't expect will happen, but what happened? Because of the special structure you have in qubits. And I just think it's very interesting to classical control by itself has this magical stuff happening because of the spectral radius and when systems are stable and so on. And this could be a very nice inter interaction. To, to look at, but I don't, I, I don't have anything concrete, more concrete than that to say. If that makes sense. Well, great. Um, okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. So thanks, Robert, for a fantastic talk. And thanks to the panelists for a wonderful discussion. So with that, I think we, uh, I should uh, say this was the this was the last colloquium for this year. So um, happy holidays to everybody, and see you again in January. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.